Hello everyone, uh, so good to, well, not see you, yeah, which is a pity, but we'll see each other somewhere, somewhere in the future, if we all survive. Uh, this talk is going to be about Rembrandt, my favorite again. I much, was looking much forward to this one. Uh, like the first one, it's about an etching, and one of my favorite and more personal of Rembrandt etchings, it's this one. The Shell. <laughs> it is a uh, beautiful etching done in 1650 uh, of an exotic shell that Rembrandt probably, well probably, most certainly would have owned in his personal uh, collection of objects that featured basically as props for his paintings. Before I'll talk more about this etching, I want to set the stage for Rembrandt in this period. I mean, the 1650s were not the easiest period for Rembrandt. Consider that in 1649 he did no painting whatsoever, at least no painting that I know of that was dated. And he didn't do any etchings whatsoever as well. So a whole year without any production whatsoever. Rembrandt was a sad and melancholic man. There were problems at home, uh, especially in the field of love. You know, remember his wife Saskia died several years before, actually the year that he painted the Night Watch. The whole year he devoted to the Night Watch. 1642, it was finished. Uh, a whole year only devoting to one painting and then your wife dies. That's uh, quite, a big, uh, quite a big setback. Uh, and Rembrandt comes into a kind of well, we would call it now a midlife crisis, but it's mostly a melancholic period in which his production goes down and actually his clients start drying out. People start forgetting about Rembrandt. And to add insult to injury, some of his pupils, splendid painters like uh, Hovot Flink or Ferdinand Bol, they took over the market and Rembrandt becomes a thing for connoisseurs and art collectors. In 1649, he also had problems in the law of department, let's say, in the Rembrandt house, because to take care of Titus, his son, his beloved son, his son that survived, by the way, which is quite a rarity, he only had, afterwards he had one child, Cornelia, uh, but Titus was, you know, really the guy in a household and would later take over the business of Rembrandt. Um, to take care of Titus, he uh, employed a woman, Geertje Dix. And uh, art lovers among us know the story. Geertje Dirks in 1650 was sent to the nut house by Rembrandt. Uh, <laughs> she wanted money of him, but Rembrandt was a really nasty fellow in those days. Rembrandt is really, it's a, it's a really kind of almost schizophrenic uh, um, uh, entity in which he's a really nasty man. There's no document whatsoever in the archives that suggests that Rembrandt was nice. But we have all that beautiful art, on the other hand, that's so consoling and so personal that Rembrandt seems to be a human being with all his flaws and all his instincts. This etching, in that sense, is important. 1650, it's the only uh, still life that he did. Um, it's a shell. A shell probably from his collection. Uh, people in the 17th century collected exotic shells and stuff from all over the world if he could afford it. And Rembrandt, although he was almost bankrupt, kept on collecting everything. A lot, loads, loads of prints, uh, exotic objects, Japanese stuff, Asian stuff, and part of that was also naturalia. I mean, we have these shells here that for us are perfectly normal and cost just a few euros or euro cents. But imagine a shell like this would set you back the equivalent of maybe 10,000 euros now. You had to order it with the East Indy Company. It took ages before it arrived and it was something out of another planet. Uh, stuff from all over the world was collected and huge prices were paid for it. Imagine a pineapple, a simple pineapple from Brazil. They didn't eat it because they were afraid of it, because it isn't mentioned in the Bible. So what they did, they encased it in resin and they kept it in the middle of the table to impress your dinner guests. You had a 20,000 euro pineapple. So you, you even had companies that uh, rented out a pineapple for an evening to impress your dinner guests. Well, Rembrandt didn't need that. He had pineapples and shells and everything you could account for in his personal collection. And imagine, in this time of destitution, uh, his friends leaving him, uh, they don't want to mingle with this guy who is behaving erratically and anti-religious and living with women without being married with him. Rembrandt 
retracts himself in the studio and starts painting the most beautiful paintings and etchings. Mostly etchings, by the way, because most of his production after the 1650s is mostly etchings to get the money floating back again. But some of them are quite personal. Rembrandt retreats in nature. He takes long walks along the river Amstel and he contemplates and makes beautiful etchings of these. You can imagine him in his room surrounded with his art collection uh, um, with his new girlfriend Hendrikje, here she is by the way, Hendrikje, um, uh, at home looking and almost fantasizing him being part of the greater world. This etching has meaning because it's his shell and this shell as you see is empty. By the way he made a little mistake, the shell is supposed to run clockwise but if you make an etching, you do it the other way around, so it works anti-clockwise. So there are actually mistakes in these etchings. But that's no problem. It's a melancholic painting of one shell, probably life-size. Life this is the actual size of the etching in a corner in his collector's cabinet. But as we see, the shell is empty. There is no life in the shell. So that was a common memento mori. Eh? Tempus fugi. Time goes by and everything dies. Uh, especially still life painters were quite fond of the, the shell. It's an empty shell without life. Rembrandt in this period must have felt this completely relevant. Death was on the loom. Remember the plague uh, epidemic that will come in a few years. And Amsterdam, an empty city, no WhatsApp, no Zoom. People were stuck in their houses and the city was bereft of any friendship, of any relationships, of any stuff that makes life worth. It was just a stone ruin and people locked in their houses. And if you were lucky, you didn't have the big red cross on your door that signified that you had the plague. So it is important in these times, get yourself together and look to nature. <laughs> Go on walks and take consolence in that because that's eternal. Rembrandt saw that as well. Nature and the world around us, um, objects that live or not live, they are eternal. But some of them remember us of the fact that w without you knowing it, life can be finished and God can take away life from you, like we see in this wonderful empty shell, a shell that would cost thousands and thousands of um, uh, guilders in Rembrandt's time. So I hope you like this one. Again, um, I would like to go on uh, in the coming days um, studying this subject of more 17th century art because that's my speciality. Um, please stay safe, please stay sane, don't kill each other and we'll see each other the next time. Cheerio! Bye-bye!